here with us. Uh, he graduated in Utrecht, Netherlands in 2014, and since then had several postdoc positions, including MIT and now currently at CERN. He has been working in heavy ion collisions, first using holographic calculations to describe the QGB thermalization, addressing this uh, non-equilibrium QCD physics and the interplay between the weak and strong QCD coupling. So his publication record has been quite notable since the beginning. And now more recently, Vilka also started to play a little bit with jets and in particular the possibility to use them to benchmark the onset of a QGP phase. So in fact, together with some CERN colleagues that he mentioned here, uh, they organized the workshop to understand the perspective of exploring the possibility of oxygen, oxygen and proton oxygen at CERN and the future LHC run tree. So these runs will serve both heavy ion community and cosmic rays. And so Vilk as one of the main organizers kindly agree to, to give us a nice uh, overview and his personal view, of course, on the topic. So Vilka, whenever you want to start it, please go ahead. You have 50 minutes and then 15 minutes of questions. So thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, also please interrupt at, uh, at any time if questions uh, doesn't have to be at the end for me. And uh, uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. And well, so so need this talk. Uh, Liliana asked me to kind of give this bit of an overview uh, on the on this workshop we are organized. So uh, we well, we shortcut it as opportunities at the LHC, where the opportunities really stands for oxygen, oxygen, and also oxygen proton collisions, which are uh, then especially relevant also for for cosmic ray uh, community. And well, Liliana also asked me a little bit to give a bit of a wider introduction, since since uh, most of you are not really working directly in uh, heavy ion collisions or quark gluon plasma, and uh, some of you are in uh, cosmic ray. So I'll try to have a little bit of an overview and also of course i cannot cover everything uh discussed at the workshop so I, the second half of the talk is mostly based on uh, results uh, i also had a uh, contribution to so that is uh, on part on energy loss and also uh, really heavy eye and uh, hydrodynamic uh, simulations and this is uh, in the code we call triactum so that uh, that i do with hofert nice and this part on energy loss was really a nice collaboration with the whole CERN group, basically, where actually I have to point out Alexander Hus, who's really from the perturbative QCD side, and, and then it's the whole heavy ion group uh, at, at CERN, where uh, recently Jasmine uh, joined us, uh, so she was not part of this collaboration yet. So, so as um, as an overview, so the introduction, uh, why do we want to study things like uh, quark gluon plasma or, or maybe QCD in general? Uh, well, one of the big motivations, of course, comes from uh, perhaps uh, the co cosmology. I mean, as, as you all know, the Big Bangs, the, the universe started very hot and it, it's about at, uh, one microsecond after the Big Bang that the whole universe was made out of quark gluon plasma. So this is, if you really want to kind of understand all these stages in the universe, uh, this plays a relatively essential role. Um, perhaps a more fundamental reason uh, that, that, that why we study this is that QCD is, of course, a fundamental force of nature. So I don't think we need much of an excuse to, to really study like how quarks and gluons form and well, uh, behave at, at a certain temperature. But on the other hand, I think well, why I really studied also myself is, and I'll say of course much more about this, is that quark gluon plasma also really turns out to be interesting. So it's not just like some quarks and gluons uh, flying around as a free gas perhaps, but actually it's kind of strongly coupled and it's really quantum. And, and actually by studying it, we can maybe even learn more about other other strongly coupled matter, so such as, for instance, in neutral stars, which could be interesting for astrophysics, or, or even maybe like things like condensed matter physics. So like I said, there may be one thing about it. Mm, so what 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 we kind of know from QCD, and also why why this is actually interesting and strongly coupled, and why it's also difficult, uh, difficult and interesting is is um, well, if we look, for instance, at the phase diagram of QCD, so, so on this on this first uh, figure, I really show the lattice equation of state of QCD. So as a function of temperature, uh, you show like uh, the energy density over T to the fourth or the pressure over T to the fourth. And uh, well, this, so this can be really computed from first principles uh, from the lattice. And, and it was actually because of the lattice calculation that we really know, for instance, that if you go from lower temperatures to higher temperatures, that there's a smooth crossover from a hadron uh, resonance gas, so gas of hadrons like ions, kaons, maybe some protons, um, to the high energy limit where, where at asymptotically high energies, of course, QCD is asymptotically free, so the coupling becomes very weak, and there's this non-interacting limit where it's just a Stefan-Boltzmann gas of quarks and gluons. 
But also what's important that you see already from this lattice calculation that uh, we're not not even really close to this non-interacting limit. I mean, you see the coupling only lo uh, runs logarithmically. So you really still have to think about this kind of phase here as a strongly coupled quark gluon plasma phase. And, and then the next, next thing I should point out is that this lattice is only Euclidean. So it's in that sense, quite limited to only temperature at, at zero chemical potential. So if you look at the full phase diagram where also there is like a baryon, a chemical potential where it's a really a baryonic uh, matter, then, then I, I only show you this uh, mu equals zero axis where you can really reliably compute from first principles. And for instance, like nuclear matter, like protons that would be more or less here. And then if a higher, a higher baryon density that would be at almost T equals zero. It would be, for instance, neutron stars. And all these things are, are difficult to compute from first principles. And also real-time dynamics. It's just like shear viscosity. You can, it's very hard to do in Euclidean signature. Uh, and you really need more like uh, other, other tools or, or, or even data, experimental data to estimate like the shear viscosity of quark gluon plasma. So say a little bit more about it. Um, so, so, okay, so this is also relevant for, for like RIC energies in Brookhaven, uh, where this is beam energy scan colliding uh, we are producing quark gluon plasmas at different kind of energies and also baryon numbers. And, and there might be this critical point we would be interested in. Then uh, to, 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 to say a little bit more about quark gluon plasma and how we actually study these things. So um, uh, most of you are probably familiar that, that, that uh, you can collide heavy ions such as lead and, and gold at, at very high energies. and. So you really have gamma factors of 2,500 or 100 at CERN or uh, Brookhaven. Uh, so you have these really Lorentz contracted pancakes and there's so much energy that all these quarks and gluons, they, they form this kind of quark gluon plasma. And I'll say more about it, but I just put a little bit of an overview here, what we kind of, what are the current questions and, uh, uh, and interest in this. And, but you see, for instance, that it's of course very hot uh, fluid. So it's like the, the typical estimate is like 10 to the 12 Kelvin. It lives very short. And this of course also makes it very difficult. So we only see like, as you see here, the products of, of this quark gluon plasma. You can only simulate these things. You cannot directly see at these kind of time scales. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about strangeness. Um, also was quite of a hot topic in the workshop. And uh, well, I, it's also a very famous result. I said it's also maybe the most perfect of a very small viscosity. Um, okay, so so then I just as an overview, which I think I mean most of you have also seen this, but it's it's also nice that this at this workshop of the oxygen collision in particular, but I'll go into more details later. That all the experiments are really I think uh, well, especially Alice, of course, is really made to study this quark gluon plasma and heavy ions, but also for oxygen, they provided many, many uh, projections and I think it will be mainly at least, but actually also LHCB was very interested because it, for, also for proton oxygen collisions and cosmic ray uh, research and, and ATLAS and CMS also really, well, they can they can more easily do like the, the very high, um, high energy jets and, and all of this kind of, maybe, maybe it's more become, all these experiments play more of a role uh, uh, as opposed to maybe lead lead collisions, which is uh, uh, more of quark gluon plasma, the oxygen, oxygen, and smaller systems. Um, there was also more interest from the other experiments. Mm, well, that's, uh, I, I thought to start maybe also to, well, I'm not an expert in the in the cosmic ray, so the, the most of the talk will be about the quark gluon plasma. But in in the workshop where we had these interesting uh, presentations uh, by by uh, mainly by Hans uh, Deminsky uh, and also by uh, LHC Forward, um, to, to motivate a little bit. So, so there are two reasons to do oxygen, oxygen, and proton oxygen. One is the quark gluon plasma, and I'll say much more about it later. But um, of course, if you have high energy and cosmic rays, uh, some of you work in this, and so you know much better than me, but you have this uh, very high energy protons hitting the atmosphere. So they mostly actually hit uh, oxygen or nitrogen, uh, which are for, for, for these kind of purposes, very, very similar. Um, and there, there is, at least was nicely explained by Hans, this, this uh, kind of puzzle in these air showers to, to, to model these. Uh, so you really have this one, single proton hitting oxygen, producing many particles. And these particles are very energetic. They hit more and more uh, air and, and they cause really this, this shower, which where you can really quite accurately measure the number of muons coming off. Um, and also as a, 
as a function of height and the number of photons. And with this, you can kind of estimate. So first of all, the, the number of muons, but also the, the penetration depth. So the idea is that, um, so the, the, the depth of the air shower, and this is then an air density unit. So it's kind of gram per, per, per square centimeter. If, if the air density is higher, of course, it doesn't get as far as so that's the relevant quantity here. So how, how, how deeply does it penetrate into the atmosphere? And, and one of the main problems there, uh, at least as, as, as was presented by us, is to kind of simultaneously fit giving a single highly energetic proton or, or well, this could also be iron, or there are many cos different cosmic, uh, energetic cosmic, cosmic rays. But it's actually a major puzzle to kind of simultaneously fit the number of muons and, and the depth it goes into. Um, of course, it's relatively easy in your model to produce more muons. But then the, the, uh, the, the interpretation is that, that this would also kind of, if you produce more energies with the same energy, then you don't get as deep. So there is, uh, in all these kind of models, it's, it's relatively difficult to get, uh, to, to get this, both of them right. So as, as you see in this plot, I mean, it's kind of this measurement by, by RJ. And, and this is kind of the typical model. And the only way to really kind of get close to some extent is, is if you really modify the pion to other hadron um, uh, ratio, because these pions, they almost immediately decay to photons and they don't interact so much anymore. So this, this pion to other hadron ratio is very important. And you see that if you change it by 20%, you, you may be able to be consistent with the data. So then the question is how, how does, um, how does the LHC could, could contribute to this kind of cosmic rays and, um, uh, and, and maybe more particular to this muon puzzle as well. Um, and well, the, the first thing I think is fairly obvious that in, in the LHC, if you would collide proton on oxygen, which they can do, um, then, then of course you can constrain, for instance, the cross section of the proton to air. Uh, and then you see, for instance, this, this Sybil uh, model used for, for, for uh, the, they have this relatively large uncertainty in the by factor 20% uh, at, at energies. And, and this is really, by here I was showing like a cosmic ray with an energy 10 to the 19 electron volt. So that, that's kind of really over here. And, and there's a relatively large uncertainty here um, in the cross section. And if you would have an LHC data point um, that, that would constrain that. Um, of, co of course, it's useful to notice that these are cent the center of mass energies uh, are not, not 10 to the 19, but you're hitting a station. It's a fixed target experiment. So in that sense, these, these energy skills are, are different. First, well, if there are questions, please interrupt me at any point. I think the, so, so, the, well, so that's one thing where, where the LHC could really help for cosmic rays. The second thing to notice is that if you look at, um, so, so, so cosmic, so if you would really collide proton and, and oxygen, and in this case at 9.2 uh, TeV, and uh, then, and this is one of the main motivations for our workshop, uh, is that, that there is, well, first of all, you would get uh, LHCB in this case would have coverage um, from, from like rapidity two to five. So it's a relatively big detector around the beam. And that would really constrain the, these models. I mean, you see there's a relatively wide band and you, you would really kind of constrain a little bit more where all these particles in these kind of showers uh, go to. Uh, but then there's a relatively interesting um, very small experiment, which is called LHCF, so it's LHC forward. And uh, actually there are only like 10, uh, 10 people working there, but, and it's uh, because the way it's set up at Atlas, it cannot run uh, after run three. So we're now uh, preparing for run three at CERN. So this will run for, I think, uh, five years or so uh, after uh, beginning next year. Uh, and after that, the, the, this uh, experiment uh, uh, will be dismantled. And, uh, for cosmic rays, this is especially relevant since it's LHC forward. It's really like 200 meters from the Atlas detector, very close to the beam line. And that's why it can actually measure this uh, extremely energetic remnants of this collision. So the, the uh, rapidity is uh, nine or, or even 10 and higher. Uh, and of course, if you have, uh, well, mostly like particle plasma, we're mostly interested in the central regime. But if you have like uh, all these particles produced with a certain transfer momentum, but these, these really have, because of this enormous boost and they, they basically have close to the original energy of 
the, the cosmic ray. Uh, so most of the energy deposited into the into this cosmic ray shower is actually at this very forward rapidity. So for cosmic rays, this, this area is actually much more relevant than uh, the, the low energy particles in, in the lab frame or in the in the proton frame. Um, yeah, so, so that's why actually it's, it would be very relevant to kind of measure now this proton oxygen uh, since LHCF is still there. Um, well, one remark I, I would have on that side is that all these things, they, they're still like 2015 and, and all these models have not been completely tuned to using already data that's, the, for instance, proton proton at 13 PV has already been measured both with LHCF and LHCB and all these plots, they still need to be updated. Uh, so one one conclusion of the workshop, I think, was that, that there's like perhaps more manpower needed to kind of fully kind of calibrate like the issue here with, with the most up to date data. So that was one of the conclusions of this workshop. But I think that at least for the cosmic rays, this is kind of the the the, the, the puzzle and the problem we kind of discussed. Um, and and okay, to get back to this pi on pi zero ratio, uh, for instance, a small quark gluon plasma in these cosmic ray showers. Could, uh, could play a role there. Um, it's not completely obvious because with quark gluon plasma, you would mostly get like by zero, by minus, by plus at the ratio of one to one to one. But if there's like enhanced strangeness that could actually affect this by zero ratio. So, so, so some research there is uh, would definitely be interesting. Are there any more questions on the cosmic ray part or? Well, otherwise, I would like to introduce a little bit more quark gluon plasma why we're interested, what's the puzzles, and, and, and why oxygen uh, would really contribute to this. Um, but, uh, yeah, again, if, if some things are not clear, please uh, please interrupt me. So, um, well, so, so, so uh, if you're really colliding these lead uh collisions, I think we uh, most of these things are, are at least at the qualitative level fairly well understood. And uh, one reason why what we kind of understand is you can already, of course, there are kind of billions of these lead lead collisions, which get very interesting statistics and dynamics. But one of the nice things is that you can already, like from just four event displays here uh, by CMS, just uh, showing you the, the the energy deposited in such a collision, which can produce like easily 20,000 particles. You can already see that there's something interesting happened and that actually is strongly coupled and, and not just a collision of like a bunch of particles flying off in, in basically random directions, which would be which would be basically the case if it would be very weakly coupled. And the reason why you can see this from this just these four event displays is that that uh, if you have like 20,000 particles, then if they are random, then they would of course be more or less circular as it is, uh, is actually a central event. But this doesn't always happen. And, and here you actually see a very strong anis anisotropy in, in just a single event uh, with many more particles this going this direction than the short direction. And the interpretation is really a hydrodynamic interpretation in the sense that you have these two ions colliding uh, and part of it just flies on because it doesn't collide. And, and, and the other part of the neutral, the, the, the nucleons, like the protons and the neutrons, they, they do collide and they form really this more or less elliptically shaped plasma, if you want, or the strongly coupled matter. And because it's elliptically shaped, so it's kind of an, what we call an anisotropy in geometry, uh, if you would have a hydrodynamic fluid or strong interactions, then there is a much larger gradient in this horizontal direction. So it's also a much larger push of the plasma to expand in the horizontal direction. Um, and, and that's really the reason why this, if you have strong interactions and an anisotropy in the spatial uh, geometry, then you get also that there are more particles in the horizontal direction. You get this anisotropy in the, in the momentum in momentum space, uh, what, you, what you really see over here. And uh, well, there's a lot of research and this is a particularly interesting one where you don't have this elliptical shape, but here you have like a, a quadruple shape. So there's like, it's, it's more or less a central event, which has a little, doesn't, it's more or less spherical, but it has this uh, non-triviality four, which is now something that you can study in more detail. The second thing why we why this is also a single event display, but it's okay. This is a very a relatively rare event where there's a uh, very large jet of 205 GeV, and what happens typically in proton proton collisions, of course, if you have like a two to two scattering, uh, this you get two jets, two showers of particles, 
but they would be fairly balanced in uh, transverse momentum uh, simply by, by momentum conservation. And what you see here, and, and this would not happen in proton-proton collisions, is that you have this, this jet going in one direction and then in the other direction, so there's like delta, delta phi is about pi, uh, the, the jet lost more than 100 GeVs of energy. And, and the interpretation is really that this, this jet was maybe produced relatively close to the edge of this quark gluon plasma. One just escaped uh, without losing too much energy. And the other one really went through this plasma and be, well, to really lose 100 GeV in, in the order of like a few Fermi over C is, is an enormous energy loss for such a, a parton. Uh, and also indicates that, that this must be a relatively strongly coupled quantum matter. Question one. Then there's, there's one final thing, which also really in, interested, I think, the, the PP community. Uh, so this, these were just lead, lead events, so just really, really relatively large uh, quark gluon plasmas. But we were going more and more, to, getting more interested in, in this kind of quark gluon plasma physics, also for smaller systems uh, produced by proton lead collisions or even by proton proton collisions. And one very nice illustration is, 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 is this plot by Alice, where they show proton proton, proton lead, and, and even and also lead lead collisions. And they show as a function of the the multiplicity, so the number of particles. So uh, the more particles you have, the, the larger the, the plasma you would have, uh, say, at least for lead-lead collisions, for proton-proton collisions, this is maybe not clear, but for proton-proton collisions, this would be called maybe event activity. And what they show here is the ratio of yields to, to by plus by, by zero of, of several uh, hadrons containing strange quarks. So this is why this is called strangeness, so k, uh, k, k ohms, lambdas, uh, size, and omegas. And, and what you really see here is that, uh, especially clear for the alma gas, that if you have very low multiplicity, there is relatively little strangeness. And as you go up in, in uh, multiplicity, then the strangeness really increases quite quite dramatically. And what's also very interesting for, for the others, you see this as well, if you, at least if you don't uh, adapt or tune PIFIA for this, uh, uh, DIPSI and equals, they, they have this included in their models, then you would not see such a strangeness enhancement. So that you would, there would be no real reason why if you have like more activity, that there would be extra strange quarks. And uh, Nadine Fischer and uh, Torbjorn Schostrand, I mean, the main authors of PIFIA, uh, they really see like the, the observation of heavy ion lake behavior in proton-proton collisions that the LHC suggests that more physics mechanisms are played and traditionally assumed. So they, they from, from a proton side, they were very interested in this, this relative behavior. Why, why does this strange strangeness increase uh, in proton collisions? And it, it really seems to depend on, on just the multiplicity if, uh, if you put this proton lead uh, on top of it. Um, and one thing I, I might come back a little bit later also, so we did this triectum hydrodynamic simulation, just assuming thermal physics for, for, for proton lead collisions in this case. And you can also plot this, the same ratios as a function of event activity. And in hydrodynamics, you would, you would not get really this, this, this slope, like the dependence on the multiplicity, but you would actually get these final ratios more or less correctly. So there's actually a bit of a significant difference for kaons. Um, especially for kaons and lambdas, but for the for the size and omega, you get it more or less right. Not exactly, but okay. So there's still work to be done there too. This is also a relatively complicated computation where there's lots of, you just have some thermal quark gluon plasma, which you decay into particles according to a Boltzmann distribution with one fitting parameter, the, the temperature where you kind of convert this plasma to particles. But then there are many QCD resonances, which then subsequently decay. And it's, it, it's a relatively, com even for the, just the thermal model, uh, it's a relatively complicated comp uh, computation. But I, I think this is basically the, the physical mechanism, which is assumed to be at play for, for lead lead collisions are very high multiplicity. Um, well, since there's this proton collisions at low, so, so there's some interest there. But as you see in this plot, uh, which was then interesting in the workshop, is that there is this uh, little bit of this gap between lead lead and proton lead, which where you would really like to see how this transition really happens from like PIFIA, QCD scattering, to more like quark gluon plasma physics. And what Alice then presented as, as a very nice projection in this, uh, this talk by Igor is that in as you maybe would expect, so oxygen oxygen collisions, they will be slightly larger than proton lead and slightly uh, smaller than lead lead collisions. And they would, you, you would really be able to find uh, have this continuous curve where you have lots of overlap in multiplicity and these ratios. Um, where I would have to add that also this, this, this proton lead would go to higher multiplicity, lead lead to lower multiplicity given 
uh, more statistics for proton lead and lead lead. And you would really be able to kind of yeah, have, have all these curves on one plot and, and be able to compare them. Here, here I put the, the oxygen oxygen minimum bias, uh, number of nucleon participants, and number of binary collision. I'll say a little bit more later on. On, on, so, so these are like lead lead collisions. There's also xenon collisions. As a function of centrality, you can select all these kind of sizes, basically of how, how many nucleons participate. Uh, and you see that well, oxygen oxygen is actually quite close to the proton lead, but it would really fill this gap and it would be it, it would be equivalent to very very peripheral lead lead collisions, so 70 to 90 percent. But these are relatively hard to study, and that's why we're very interested in these oxygen oxygen collisions. Mm, a little bit short on time, but I wanted to show a little bit more about how this works in practice, uh, especially this kind of anisotropy. So you, you really would like to kind of select uh, such an event and, and, and quantify this kind of anisotropic geometry. And how this is done is, is looking at the number of particles as a function of the angle to a Fourier transform, and then this V2 coefficient is then called the elliptic flow, and you can then plot this as a function of centrality. Uh, so for very central collisions, for very peripheral, where only a small overlap. Uh, and you can then, then actually fit this to a hydrodynamic model. This is one of the first ones, and, and these are now much more advanced. Um, why I'm showing this is that this is one way to kind of get the viscosity. But I'm also showing you, because this, this picture, what I kind of explained, where you have this elliptical geometry, which expands amongst the, the, the short axis is also actually seen uh, in these kind of fermions at unitarity. So this is a strongly coupled quantum gas. And uh, there, the nice thing why I showed this is this is real experimental results and these are just pictures. Uh, and in, in some sense, it's strongly coupled quantum matter. So very similar physics is at play in this kind of strongly coupled quark gluon plasma and this kind of Fermi gas. And, and here, I, I think it, it illustrates more clearly what I meant with this short axis expanding hydrodynamically uh, with very low shear viscosity, which you can an estimate from these kind of movies. To, to go a little bit more, because, because I think well, this elliptic flow is really the, the essence of, of, of what, what we study and how we get the shear viscosities and how we understand this kind of plasma, uh, I want to show you a little bit more how to exactly extract it. So, uh, and it's really done even in proton-proton collisions, which I'm displaying here, low multiplicity and at high multiplicity. So these are just CMS, proton-proton 13 PV. And these are just two particle correlation functions as a function. So this, uh, two, uh, if two particles with a certain separation in, in, in delta phi and in, in delta eta. And in pro normal in proton-proton, you see basically dominant two effects. So first one is as delta eta and delta phi is zero, there is a large correlation. So this is this jet, which has a shower of many particles. So if you have one particle, you're relatively likely to find a nearby particle. So this is kind of jet fragmentation. And then by momentum conservation, you're very likely to find that delta phi equals pi also particles, but uh, they don't have to be conserved the momentum in, uh, in the longitudinal direction. So it's spread out in, in, in rapidity. Uh, okay, so that's, that's relatively well understood. And, and then when you go to heavy ion collisions, it looks very different. And that's then very interesting. There's still a little bit of this kind of fragmentation peak over here. But you see that things are very flat and spread out in, the, in, 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 in uh, delta eta. And there's a, there's a new ridge here, which is called the near side ridge. Uh, and you have a correct characteristic shape here. And this is really the shape I was talking about. So, so this shape here, you can Fourier transform. And that's what plotted over here. Um, because it doesn't depend on, on this kind of fragmentation and jet like physics, it, it's really a property which only also doesn't depend on, delta, on, on the rapidity. So it's really a property of kind of the shape of your initial geometry in transverse plane of your quark gluon plasma. And that's, that's what's, what gives this Fourier transform. And that's also, yeah, okay. So you typically try to take indeed like large delta eta. So you really try to take this curve. Uh, to, to get rid of this kind of what we call non-flow effects and fragmentation and back-to-back -back, uh, jets. And what was then crucial uh, is already kind of a few years ago now, maybe 2016, um, is that in proton-proton collision at high multiplicity, you see this kind of what we call near side rich emerging. Uh, so still the dominant physics completely is just this two to two QCD and fragmentation physics, but there is this non-trivial rich here and uh, you can extract like the V2 and um, 
well, I, don't, I, I really don't have time to go into all the details, but, but Atlas did a very careful, uh, careful fit in, in this kind of thing, analysis with these black points being this kind of uh, rich, I, I was just showing you, just a, just a cut at the, the large delta eta. And they kind of managed to uh, disentangle kind of this, this uh, the, 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 what, they, what they call the template or the, the, white, the white one, which is kind of the very peripheral uh, non-flow non effects. And, and then this onset of this, this rich as a function of multiplicity to kind of see a little bit if there would be a plasma, if it would depend on multiplicity, what would this V2 of the plasma be in this proton-proton collision? And, and very interestingly, then they found that this is, uh, first of all, uh, non-trivial. So there is like a 6% elliptic flow and also that it doesn't depend on the multiplicity. So the, to some extent, there is kind of this, this evidence of that, that, that there could be a small amount of quark gluon plasma and proton proton collisions, uh, even to relatively high multiplicity. And the strangeness also indicates these kind of things. And of course, this is not really, well, it's definitely not a proof that there is quark gluon plasma, but it all kind of it has the same, uh, same phenomenology as quark gluon plasma. And this is also probably why these authors of Piffia were kind of interested in this, this kind of phenomenon. To counter this a little bit, I and then I'll show you a little bit more about, about work we did on ourselves on this. This is it. if you uh, if you have this quark gluon plasma, I showed you that these jets are expected to lose energy uh, in this, for instance, in these dijet pairs. And uh, for, for well, the, the one way to I'll say more about it is to quantify this is the nu nuclear modification factor. So for lead lead, you see indeed there are many fewer jets, like by a factor of five maybe at some some PTs. Uh, because of this effect, and for this proton let you actually see a slight enhancement. So you don't you don't see this effect at all. So there's no you would have this quark gluon plasma, but no naively at least energy loss, which would would either impl imply that uh, of course this plasma could not be there, but would also be very small, and that's just not significant. So we go into that more detail. So there's a bit of these two, but this is another sign of quark gluon plasma, which actually is not there for these small systems. And well, that brings a bit of this overview of at least the current discussions we have in this in, in heavy ion physics, or uh, in, the, in this case, maybe light ion, uh, light ion physics. So previously, of course, there was a bit of this picture that you had like proton-proton collisions with like parton-parton scattering, fragmentation. And then there was heavy ion collisions where you have like many, many particles. And it's more like a collective effect and it's hydrodynamics. And these were in some sense maximally different. So here's many scatterings, there's few scatterings, many particles, few particles. Uh, here it would equilibrate here. It would just be perturbative, theoretical, uh, no, no equilibration. Uh, and, and I think given especially these proton lead and also proton proton at higher energies at higher multiplicities, you see that at least for some observables, these things come a little bit together now. So you, you, the jets are important, uh, well, for sure for, for proton collisions, but in heavy ions are also very uh, interesting. And you, you kind of need, at least if you want to describe everything in proton-proton collisions, uh, QGP type physics uh, to, 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 to describe everything. And then, then so, okay, so the, to kind of bridge this gap and understand this much better, is, uh, it would be really ideal to have kind of an intermediate size, uh, not really that lead, not really proton-proton, but oxygen-oxygen would be a very good example. More uh, details for that. Mm, to, okay, so then, then I wanted to, one of these talks and also a paper uh, myself on this is about this part on energy loss in proton proton collisions. And uh, so we try to kind of give some realistic estimates why it is. And one of the motivations is, uh, as, as, as I briefly showed and briefly mentioned, is that you can have like similar, si similar sizes in oxygen oxygen collision, minimum bias in this case, and lead lead collisions, which are very peripheral, like seven, 70 to 90% centrality. But, and you can then compute this nuclear modification factor as a function of these kind of centrality selections in lead lead or also xenon xenon. Um, where I should yeah, explain maybe once more in a little bit more detail that this nuclear modification factor is really kind of you try to estimate if you have, for instance, a lead lead collision or oxygen oxygen on proton lead doesn't really matter. You try to estimate how many equivalent PP collisions you would have, and then how many equivalent jets or hadrons uh, you would uh, expect to get. I and mean, of course you expect to get many more because you have all these kind of binary collisions. Um, 
So that's kind of how these number of binary collisions are, are, are estimated. And that's how this nuclear modification factor is constructed. And then you can also imagine a little bit more the subtleties of selecting like the 70, 90% peripheral lead lead collisions where you might have only like five or 10 nucleons uh, really colliding. Um, and then it depends very much on the model actually, uh, how many of these kind of what's called binary collisions you actually get. So the, the uncertainty on modeling the centrality class becomes really quite large. And you see this actually on the error. So to some extent that these very peripheral ones, it is consistent with one, but it's also just very uncertain and it's very model dependent. Uh, and that's uh, why, why in this paper, one of the, the first things we, we, we kind of realize is if you want to have the real precise understanding of energy loss in these kind of very small systems or even very peripheral like that, it's much, much more accurate to really go to minimum bias uh, so you don't have any of these models or uncertainties, uh, and then you can uh, much more uh, detail refine, uh, define this nuclear modification factor as just the ratio of two cross sections where the, the, there's a factor of A squared because you really get many more uh, binary collisions. And well, it is, of course, there's much reason for this kind of precision, which we then probably need is because the expected effect is very small. So this, this kind of Glauber modeling, I was kind of this modeling is really kind of important. So, okay, so minimum bias with smaller ions, which, which would, would then be um, oxygen oxygen. And then there are two things uh, we, we studied in more detail after making this argument is first of all, what do we expect for as a signal? And so, and, and how do we control like, there's also a nuclear effect. So that's kind of the next thing to have like a theoretical prediction of what would happen. Um, so the first thing we try to compute is to just compute the, the complete spectrum of, of jets in this case, and, and also hadrons later in oxygen-oxygen um, collisions. And uh, to, to, without assuming any quark gluon plasma or energy loss. So this is kind of just what we call the, the, the benchmark or baseline scenario. So no energy loss. And then it's actually important to, well, first of all, there are all kinds of uncertainties. So you really need to do kind of this two to two scattering plus the fragmentation, there's perturbative QCD matrix elements. Um, but then what's very important is that the, the number of quarks and gluons, uh, parton distribution functions in oxygen are a, a bit different than in protons. And there is also a lot of uncertainty in that. So that, that's something which actually is the dominant uncertainty here in this uh, uh, production of, of Yet in this case. So we really try to kind of do a very careful computation at next to leading order also in this case uh, with help of, the, of, uh, of Alexander Hus, uh, who's an expert in that, referring like your normalization skill, factorization skill. Um, we do see that if you take this ratio, like for instance, uh, also PDF errors, for instance, if you take the ratio from oxygen to, to proton proton, then most of this, the uncertainties in proton-proton spectra, which are also sizable, uh, they cancel, uh, which I guess makes sense because you're just dividing two things at the same energy. Um, but the remaining part is then how, the, what, what, the, how, how oxygen is changed with respect to oxygen, so it's PDFs, that uncertainty uh, remains quite large. And you can reweight this with extra data, data, which we did, and then you see that the error is like a few percent, like two or three percent. Uh, without assuming any energy loss. And so this is kind of the baseline we would like to compare with. And this is also, so for instance, if the energy loss signal is expected to be 2%, then it's not a very good motivation to measure this because, okay, then the, 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 the QCD error, if you wish, is also about 2% and then there's not much you can conclude. So, okay, so that the next thing, and I'll, I'll mostly skip skip all these details. We wanted to have like a very, very simple model. This, this is just to illustrate that this is a very simple model. I mean, this is not a realistic quark gluon plasma. We took like a formal equation of state. We didn't take this V4, we only took the V2. So it's it's just very simple. Um, and, and then we tried like four also relatively simple energy loss. So this BDMPSC is, is a, just a simple differential equation, but it's very well motivated from perturbative QCT. Then we did some energy loss formulas like D to the power 1.2, D to the power cubed, and, 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 and another more complicated formula, but it's, it's also easy to compute actually. So also four energy loss scenarios, just to, just to have an idea, simple model with four simple formulas. And what we then did is we looked at lead data, proton data, PLED data, and 
so there's one well all these all these energy loss uh, basically have a normalization factor so they all have one free parameter and we took this minimum bias point at 50 gv where we think the model works best at least the perturbative qcd model and we fit this parameter and the errors to to, to have such that this at this point is guaranteed to fit and then the whole pt range of the nuclear modification factor and also centrality dependence and all these kind of things are then predictions of the model um and and for instance so, okay so for all these collision types you can then show predictions and you know, you know for instance there's data and then oxygen would be this this green band here so you see already here that that there would be like a 20 percent effect and well this is all for only one of our models so we actually why well, we have like several of these models but here you would expect about a 20 percent effect and as i showed the error is about three percent so that would be very good news just to show you a little bit more how this how this works. So there's also different centralities, and and they all so the, just with one free parameter, you see both the PT dependence and the centrality dependence is uh, is fitted fairly well, except for this very peripheral like the 70 to 90 percent bin I was referring to previously. The model doesn't have energy energy loss, but the data does. But then there's also this very large error here, which is the normalization error. So this is this TAA modeling error. Which we wanted to get rid of to go into PP collisions. We think this is very, this error is actually very irrelevant. It should be added onto these error bars for the data. Xenon, Xenon, similar story. And this is just to kind of summarize like, okay, we had all these energy loss models, we had like different settings of our mediums. So, okay, I, I don't want to go, we just have many models. That was kind of the idea. And all these models they have then, well, we try to fit them to this, to this one data point in that LED. And then see if it works for both the centrality the dependence and then also the, the PT dependence. And in this case, actually for LED LED, all these models, they work fairly well, of course, because they fitted one parameter, but still a bit non-trivial, except for this one blue curve here. So this blue curve actually doesn't explain the centrality dependence. And on these grounds, we, we don't use this model C here. Um, okay, and then once you have all these models, which do fairly well for let let you can of course run them for oxygen and oxygen so these are then really the predictions of these in this case like 12 models for for oxygen collisions and and what we then finally did is to combine all these kind of things so we had this kind of benchmark calculation for perturbative qcd and all these 12 models including the uncertainties uh, and uh, well i have to say that this benchmark calculation is now different because these are hadrons and not jets so these are single particles so you also need to fragment the jets and that's why this, this hadron plot looks a little bit different. But you really see that for almost all of these models, if you go into this region of like 30 to 50 GeV, you would be able to see a difference between uh, this nuclear PDF baseline and, and these energy loss models. And that would then be interpreted as seeing really energy loss in these oxygen and oxygen collisions. Any questions about, about this kind of th this part? Okay, then, then I'll switch a little bit gears again. Uh, well, also because I was asked to, to provide a bit of an overview of this workshop. Um, so, so this is work actually with Robert Nice based on, on this uh, trajectum where we really did a Bayesian analysis. Uh, well, first of all, constraining uh, parameters of the quark gluon plasma. There are many parameters. I'm just showing a sketch here of these 21 parameters which you fit using Bayesian techniques. And then for for a few for for a few of these parameters in the Bayesian techniques, you can these are all fitted to let let data, and they, they they provide these bands, and they go more or less through like spectra, the, the multiplicities, uh, spectra, and also the mean PT, these feed two coefficients, and well, it works quite well. And and then uh, for the workshop, we also presented then that you can use the same model to run for oxygen oxygen and really get predictions for that. So this this looks a little bit like this. And you see that the bands are slightly wider than for let let, which really indicates that these are fitted to let let and that there is more uncertainty on OO because there's no data. And what we then also tried is that imagine, okay, we have these 10 predictions in here plotted. Uh, look for all these 10 predictions, rerun your Bayesian fits again with these 10 predictions and see if then there are more constraints. So it's kind of the idea that imagine you are at the top of this curve or you're at the bottom of this curve after the measurement does it really provide you an extra constraint on, on the quark gluon plasma? And uh, well, I show uh, we have many parameters and there's many things to show, but I show one example here, which is the nucleon width. So it could be like maybe 0.7 Fermi or 1.1 Fermi, uh, 
depending on the model perhaps. And this is not, not clear from that lead collisions, but you see that for instance, if you then put in and run oxygen uh, with this red curve, so this is kind of where we, where we generated oxygen collisions, you see that indeed the Bayesian analysis prefers a smaller width. Uh, and you see that you get more constraining picture of like well, what you're colliding and, and on these parameters of your, of your quark gluon plasma evolution. Um, well, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't want to go into too many details, but we did this for all our parameters in, in our model. And for this width, for instance, you fi we find that, uh, that the errors get like 17% smaller. So we really get a little bit of, a, of an improvement in the constraints on the width. And we also see that well, if, if you have this true width, like this red one I was showing you at 0.7, then you see that the preferred value also gets like 0.8. So it gets lower than it used to be. It used to be 0.9, the preferred value, the, the mean. Um, and there's a bit of a correlation, but, but not, not exact. And I think you also don't expect that because well, we just use this 0.7 to generate the oxygen collision. So you don't expect it to go all the way to the line, but you see that if it turns, it, it, well, given the oxygen data and a lower width, then you would also find a lower width. So this correlation is quite important. Somewhat maybe um, disappointingly, so for the eta over s and the, the bulk viscosity, so these are the viscosities. So for eta over s actually is no improvement. So it's minus 8% even, and for bulk viscosity also only 12%. So it seems like for well, the fluctuations per nucleon nucleon thing, you can we, we really get a large improvement and also for the, the temperature switch. So there's some things we get improvement for, but not really for like QGP properties like viscosity. So in that sense, it's a little bit disappointing, but you do get a little bit more of a feel for what, what the nucleon nuclear collision, uh, at least within this relatively large model, uh, would look like. Well, then, then I couldn't resist to add this uh, relatively last minute because but you can go to this Rick live uh, event displays. And if you if you go there right now, I think till Friday, uh, they're, uh, they are now running oxygen oxygen collisions. So for us, this was very good news. At the time of the workshop, this was not yet known, but they're now doing a more than a full week. And uh, yeah, you can really go to this website and you can literally see these oxygen collisions going at the, at, at, at the Ray, Brookhaven National Laboratory at, at a much lower energy, 200 GeV. Um, but this really motivated us to, to really study this, this this week actually with triactum and also make predictions for spectra and the, the VNs, uh, these elliptic flow coefficients for oxygen at lower energies. Uh, we'll have to look at this more carefully, but one interesting thing is that this V4 gets negative and also the V3 changes sign as functional centrality. So I mean, we, we have to see if these are very robust predictions also for other settings of the model, but at least at the moment this, this looked quite interesting, but it's quite exciting that this, that we can also, if we do these oxygen collisions at LHC, they can do them also at RIC and compare different energies, which I think makes uh, the picture much more complete. As, as a last point, uh, I'm not sure if there are LHCB uh, physicists in the audience, but one thing I was I'm quite excited about myself is LHCB. Well, first of all, that is relatively large rapidity coverage for, for oxygen oxygen collisions, but they have this new smog 2 detector where really into the beam, you have like a storage cell for gas and you can inject gas into the beam. And so this has been now been uh, injected and uh, this, this gives uh, really different opportunities for, for, for light ion collisions, like not only oxygen, but you can inject into the beam also argon, neon, uh, helium. And, and then of course you can, you can inject it during the proton run and then proton can uh, collide with the gas. Uh, or you can also do it during the lead run and you can have lead on oxygen. Um, of course, then not both of them, it's a fixed target experiment. So the, the, the collisional energy, the center of mass energy is much lower, like 110 GeV. This is still comparable with, with these rig collisions at 200 GeV. So still, I think very interesting physics also there. And you know, so it's in that sense complementary, but of course it's much wider setup. And yeah, you also have a much, much different rapidity coverage because you're really doing things in the in the frame of the the, the, the target nucleus, the measurement, instead of having it in the lab frame, um, the center of mass frame. So, so that's it's very complementary. And the nice thing is also that you can do it during the proton collision, so proton oxygen year round. So you can have really lots of data and integrated luminosity. And from this kind of Bayesian perspective, I was 
just briefly showing, I think this would be really great. So sort of like a wide variety of colliding systems and energies, and this would really help the, the heavy ion program and, and also the light ion program with this light nuclei. Okay, I think well, it's also exactly 15 minutes, so I should probably wrap up a little bit. So the, the LHC is a light ion collider. And oxygen and proton oxygen uh, in particular. And um, well, I think we kind of can make a convincing point that, that this can really provide like key extra insights to these heavy ion puzzles because these heavy ion puzzles really extend to these small systems. Like when does the plasma form? How small can it be? Like there's so much, there's quite a lot of uncertainty in this proton, 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 lead kind of things I, I was showing you. And, and I think oxygen can, can provide there like this, this, this middle ground. Uh, in particular, for instance, this precision analysis on this protonic energy loss, I tried to show you that convention that you can accurately measure like within 3%, this kind of baseline and that the energy loss in certain PT ranges should be maybe 20%. And that that, that would be uh, much easier to see than for instance, proton lead where this might not be visible and where it is actually not seen. Uh, and I, also that, that yeah, this uh, can definitely also constrain initial models of quark gluon plasma things so that I think also interesting. Uh, well, I'm not an expert, but I tried to show you a little bit, at least my perspective then on this, what, what it can do with proton oxygen for cosmic rays. Uh, can also, proton oxygen can also be very helpful to uh, constrain PDFs of oxygen. And there's actually no data at all, even at lower energies on oxygen uh, and PDFs. So it can also be interesting. And then of course, well, it was a, a wide workshop and I skipped many things also from the machine perspective, like how to inject oxygen, it's actually lots of radiation, so kind of, uh, these kind of things. And well, I listed four things in particular. So for instance, a lot of discussion was if, if ox the structure of oxygen. So the, the theory I think is that oxygen is made out of four, at least preferentially of four alpha particles. And uh, I put all these simulated oxygen nuclei here, uh, you have to look very carefully, but sometimes I think you can see a little bit four of these kind of nucleons together, which would then be kind of four alpha particles. But okay, and during the workshop, it seems hard to kind of, if you collide these kind of things to figure out if it's four alpha particles or just random number of nucleons and look at yourself at these pictures, you probably agree with that. I, I skipped also many impressive projections by Elise and this included like this V2 coefficients up to 12 particle cumulants. So you already they extracted this V2, not using only this kind of rich thing, but using 12 particles together and it's really quite impressive. Uh, other interesting results is mean transverse momentum and V2, they can correlate them, I mean, interesting. Uh, well, and I already mentioned kind of these, these, uh, these PDFs and uh, well, I hope to give a little, have to give a little bit of an overview in the Thanks for the interaction. Thank you very much, Wilke, for this very nice uh, overview.